Oftentimes, I find myself in need of a clock or a timer for my games, like especially a mini game or just anything that needs time. And you could obviously go the route of doing a while wait loop and just updating a GUI, but there's a few problems with that. First of all, wait just isn't that good. You can only count in seconds. You can't go down to milliseconds. And the display looks ugly if it's over 60 seconds. So in this video, I will show you how to solve all of these problems by making a little GUI-based clock that you can control in the client. So let's get started. So I'm in a new fresh base plate Roblox project. First thing I'm going to go do is go into Starter GUI, click the plus, and create a screen GUI. doesn't really matter what the name is. And I'm going to click the plus again and create a text label. And this is going to be what's going to display our time for our clock. So I'm going to go down to the properties. First of all, I'm going to make it centered by setting the anchor point dot x, just the first value to 0.5. So then I can go down to position and set the x position, the first value there, to 0.5. So now it's centered and it's anchored in the center so it'll always be centered no matter what device it's on. I'm going to set the size to some scale values. Let's just do 0.5 on the X scale and then 0.1 on the Y. There we go. Make sure text scaled is turned on and you can play around with these settings and just to get in the mood I'll set the text to 0, 0. So now that our UI is done, we can go into our text label and create a local script to start scripting our timer. Now in this example, I'm going to be making a timer that starts at a value and goes down. Using the code, you could also change it to make a clock that goes up. It's up to you what you can do. This is what I'm going to do when I find most useful. So first thing I'm going to start is by defining our run service, which will be equal to game get service run service. And this is going to be responsible for recording our times for our timer because it has a bunch of functions that allow us to run a function every frame with the time in between each frame and that'll allow us to decrement our value to a very precise degree. Next we're going to get our label which will be equal to script.parent and now we can define a function which will be start timer. This is a function that will take in a time left parameter, which will be the time left from, like, like let's say 10 seconds. Like that'll start 10 and it'll go all the way down to zero. Inside our function body, we can say run service bind to render step. And it takes three parameters the name of our binding, I'll just name it timer, the render priority, enum dot render priority there we go dot last dot value minus one you can set that to whatever you want it's an integer and it basically just says when our function is going to be called the higher the number the later it's called and for our uh, application it doesn't really matter too much and as our third and final parameter we're going to send in a function with a delta parameter. So what bind to render step does is it binds this function to run every render step which is every frame according to our binding value our render priority and it gives us a handy delta variable which is the time since the last frame. So delta is the time since the last frame. So what we can do with that is we can say our time left minus equals delta. And what this says is time left equals time left minus our delta. So if time left is 10, delta is 1, our time left would be equal to 9 after this operation. And for demonstration, I'm just going to say label dot text equals time left. So it'll decrease our time left every time and our label.txt will be equal to time left just for a little display. Now we can go down to the bottom and say t start timer with a value of 10 seconds. So what should happen, we'll run this, 
as we get our timer starts at 10 now it's going down there is no restriction at the bottom so it will go into negatives we'll obviously fix that a little bit later but you can see all of these nice juicy numbers that we have to work with with our display so the current value of our text label looks kind of ugly we only have seconds there's no minutes so if it goes over 60 seconds it'll be a really weird number and in today's day and age when we have our digital clocks with a nice little like format so it'd be for example it'd be like zero one then be like 30 seconds and let's say one hundredth it would like look like this it look really nice so now we need to make our timer do that and in my example I'm only gonna be going to hundredths of a second you can go to milliseconds if you want you can go to tenths if you want this is just what I'm gonna do so first things first I'm gonna make our minutes variable and bear with me here I'm gonna do the math and do all the calculations but I'll explain it in detail in a in a bit so this is just for the people who just want the code and so we're gonna say math.floor time left divided by 60 for our seconds we're say math.floor time left modulo 60 this is the modulus operator it's the percent sign and all it does is gets the remainder from a division operation and then finally we can say hundredths I think I spelled that right this will be math.floor time left modulo 1 times 100 and so for our label.txt actually let me move the time left up a little bit just so it makes a little more logical sense and for our label.txt we can change this value from time left to string.format so string.format takes in a format string and then some parameters our format string will be a percent sign that's a dollar sign percent sign 0 2 i then colon then we can just take the percent sign 0 2 i copy it once then another colon then paste it again so if you think of each of these percent like blocks as one little block separated by colons you can see that it'll look like our little clock up here and what this percent and like our expression means is the percent basically initiates a formatting string and we have 0 2 which basically takes our integer which is represented by the i and if it's less than two digits it'll left pad it with a zero so like up here if we didn't have this zero two it would just say one instead of zero one but we want to have zero one just because if it's in the interior like over here it'll like cut off like that and it'll look really stupid so we need to have that left pad just so it looks a little better and we just repeat that a few times for minutes then seconds then hundredths of a second and then in our string dot format after our format string we send in the parameters to fill each integer value so then we can send in minutes then seconds then hundredths of a second and so that should work pretty well let's run this and you can see it actually looks really really nice it's scrolling down it's staying it's not fluctuating around the screen it's going all the way down to zero which is nice still goes negative and you can see it looks kind of weird so I just threw a ton of code at you and now I'm going to explain it because without writing and without visualizing it it'll be a lot harder to understand and this is the process that I went through to come up with these equations so we're going to first start with finding the minutes so I have this base number 100.654 seconds and in order to find the minutes it's actually pretty straightforward we just divide by 60 because there are 60 seconds in a minute so we need to get rid of seconds and turn it into minutes but we get a weird number so let me just bring up the calculator and we can send in 100.654 divided by 60 this will give us 1.7 about and that's decimal minutes are whole numbers so what we do is we floor it and that basically gets rid of 
the decimal values, it brings it down, like it automatically rounds down, gets rid of all of our decimal information. And other programming languages, this is known as just integer division, but in Lua, we only have numbers, so we just have to floor it using a function. And that gives us a nice value of one minute. Then for seconds, we use do something a little bit differently, but a, but the same sort of idea. We use the modulus operator to get the remainder after we get our minutes. So 100 divided by 60 will give us 1, like whatever. And then what we can do to get seconds is we can just say 1 times 60. This will give us 60, obviously. Then we can take this value and just subtract it from this value, or the other way around. Take 60, subtract it from this value, and that'll give us our seconds. So if I bring up the calculator once again, we can say 100.654 divided by 60. Not divided, I meant to say minus. Let's do that again. Minus 60 will give us 40.654. 40 40.654. 40 seconds, but we don't want this decimal information. Seconds aren't whole numbers, so we floor it once again. And that's also pretty straightforward. So now we're at 1 minute and 40 seconds. And you can see how instead of just multiplying minutes by 60 and then getting that and subtracting it, we use the modulus operator because that does the same thing. We How many times does 60 go into 100? It goes into it once with a remainder of 40.654 seconds. And then finally, for our hundredths of a second, we need to do something a little bit differently. First thing we want to do is divide by 1 or do modulus by 1 to get that remainder. And since 1 goes into 100.654, 100 times we get a remainder of 0 0.654. And this isolates our decimal values, which is really, really nice. But if we were to display this value, it would look really weird. It'd be like, zero zero let me just and it'd be zero point seven or something like that that would look stupid so what we do is we can multiply this by a hundred and this would give us six five point four and then we floor it to get rid of the extra digits that we don't really need and this gives us sixty five hundredths I'm just gonna say H so then that gives us all of these numbers in a nice concise fashion with as minimal code as possible. So I hope that helped explain what we're doing here. And I know it can look a little daunting at first, but if you just break it down, I recommend bringing out a piece of paper and just start writing an example number and just figure out how you can get your values. I do this with a bunch of stuff, not just finding time. It's good for a bunch of different things just in programming and scripting in general. So our start timer function is basically done. But you'll notice if we were to like go past zero, for example, it does not stop. So we need to fix that. So I'm going to say if time left is less than or equal to zero, then first thing we need to do, or only thing we need to do actually is just say one service unbind from render step and just send in our timer. So you can see we have a repeating variable, or literal, I should say, and that's a bad idea. So I'm going to go to top of my script, define a constant, and this will be our timer binding name. And I'll set this to timer. And I can just replace this with this constant, timer binding name, and then timer binding name. So this prevents us from having a typo because the interpreter will realize that the variable is wrong. So instead of just a string typo, we'll have a actual like error, which is good. It's a lot better than repeating your code all over the place. So if we were to run this, our timer should stop around zero. And this really doesn't matter until we add the last feature of our time, you can see it goes a little bit past, that's okay. And the last feature we're going to add is waiting. So right now, if we have our timer, let me just put a print statement after the timer. So you just print hello.
you can see it runs instantly, which is not good if you want to have a step-by-step -step script, imperative script. It won't really work too well, and it's not very intuitive if you're working with a team because it's like a wait function, but it doesn't wait. So the way we're going to do that is by adding a bindable event. So we're going to say local delay event equals instance dot new bindable event. And what we'll do is we'll say delay event dot event wait. So this will wait for our event to fire, and then once it does, we can return. So it'll yield the script, which will basically mean stop the script until our start timer function is done timing. So then we can, in our uh, time left break, we can just say delay event fire. So when our time reaches zero, we can fire our event. And for example, we could say label.time or label.text equals done all the way down here. Let me just zoom in so you can see it. We can just say label.text equals done after the timer finishes. So the timer starts going down as per usual. And then once we reach the bottom, it'll say done. And you can obviously customize it. You can get rid of this if you want, only make it an event. So like make, maybe make it return the event so that a script could wait if it wants to, but if it doesn't want to, it just won't. It's up to you. So that's about it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Comment any questions or video suggestions down below. And if you want, join my Discord server. Link will be in the description. We talk a lot. You can get scripting help there. And you can just generally discuss Roblox scripting or any scripting for that matter. But other than that, I hope you guys have a nice day and goodbye.